Welcome, good morning. Good to try it in Spanish too. Bienvenidos a todos. All right. Great, great to have you all here and to be together to worship the Lord. So let's stand and do just that.
sacred hill where violence purchased peace the innocent was found to set the captives free there you made a way the lost are welcomed home again at the cross your glory born
please remain standing as we read from God's word, the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and the cure and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Parpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored, like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Amen. Please have a seat. Well, if you got your Bible, open it to the book of John, chapter 9. We're going to continue our study in the Gospel of John. And we're going to be looking at one more of the miracles that uh, the Apostle John highlights for us in the book of John. This is the sixth out of the seven miracles in the book of John, actually, that, that John highlights. And we know that there were many, many more than this. And John himself says later in the book, boy, if I had recorded everything from the life and ministry of Jesus, it would just be beyond anything I could possibly write. Um, so he presents the ministry of Jesus in such a way as led by the Holy Spirit to give us a wonderful picture of our Savior. And uh, we're going to be continuing that this morning. As we do so, we all want to come to the study of God's Word in a place where we're ready to learn. We're ready to be taught by the Spirit of God, and we know that the, there's one thing that for us as believers becomes a real problem, and that is the aspect of sin. Uh, it hinders our fellowship with the Lord, and it's something that our, our sin problem is taken care of by our Lord Jesus on the cross. It was taken care of once and for all. And as we put our trust in Jesus Christ, that penalty for our sins is canceled. However, we're still living in this world. We're still living in the flesh. We still have a human, uh, we're still in our human flesh and we have a sinful nature and that still is something that we're stuck with essentially while we're living on this earth until we are glorified. And so we want to... Um, make sure that we take care of those sins as they come up. And we have a great example in, in Scripture from the psalmist David. He writes in, in Psalm 51, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He uses this analogy of um, physical cleansing. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So he, he comes and he... Um, presents himself to the Lord in the manner of someone needing physical cleansing. So if you think of hyssop and the, the imagery there in the Old Testament, the hyssop branch was used as, in terms of disinfecting. You know, there would be a, a person's house, that um, a person that had leprosy, they would have to go to the Levites, the Levites would have to go in and, and disinfect, and they would use a hyssop branch as part of that and then determine at a certain point, whether the, the house was clean and, and was ready to go again. And the Levites would make those sort of health determinations. They were sort of the public health agents of the day in, in the Old Testament, in, in the sacrificial system when you're talking about the tribe of Israel and, and sort of one of the roles of the, the priests would play. Anyways, all that to say that this is a great example for us, looking at how David uses that imagery and applies it to himself in terms of his own sin, he recognizes it, and he rec recognizes that he needs cleansing from it. And so that's where confession comes in. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's just a great promise and a great um, hope that we have in our, our Lord that he is 
the kind who cleanses and restores and is eager to forgive. So let's take a moment for silent prayer and we can take care of anything like that before the Lord and then we will be ready to learn from his word as we study it this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for the constant reality of close fellowship with you that we can experience as believers. Thank you that we can be indwelt by your Holy Spirit, that great gift that you give to each of us at salvation. Help us to come to an understanding, a better understanding, a realization of what specifically that means to be empowered and indwelt and led by your Holy Spirit. It's always a choice before us. Are we going to walk after our own flesh or are we going to walk after your spirit. Lord, we pray this morning that you would guide us into the truth of your word, that your spirit would illuminate it for us, that you would help us to desire to, to come to know you through your word. Thank you for sending your son to walk this earth, to take on human flesh, to show yourself to us. Lord, we pray that his example would be one that we would eagerly desire to learn from. Lord, help us to be people that are not just hearers, but doers. Help us to take your word and to apply it to our lives. Lord, help us to see that application, that it's great to understand, it's great to become familiar with, but where does it impact our lives? What uh, change needs to affect me in light of your word? Help it to become a mirror for each one of us. Lord, we Thank you that through it we can know you, we can know your heart. We ask that you would bless this time we have in your word, that you would use it in a mighty and powerful way in our lives, in our church, and as we go out from here into our community. And we ask that your word would have powerful effects in terms of how it applies in our lives and how we interact with those that you bring across our paths. Lord, thank you for, the, for those divine encounters, interactions where you bring people, events, circumstances together as only you can do. Your, your plan is perfect. Your ways are perfect. We many times don't understand, but help us to trust you. We ask you'd bless this time we have in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you might recall where we left off last time in chapter 8, Jesus makes, I don't know, I guess we could say a great escape. Um, he miraculously escapes from the temple, um, out of this temple courtyard in Jerusalem. He was surrounded by great hostility. The Jews we, we saw were, were searching for stones that they were going to pick up and throw at him. And in that very moment, he was elusive and he escaped from danger. And it was a miracle that God worked to protect Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 9, it begins against this very backdrop of this severe anger and hostility toward Jesus. The Jewish religious leaders, we could say they've had it with Jesus. They've refused to believe in him. They've determined to even expel from the local synagogue, anyone who would believe in him or anyone who would even suggest that he could be the Messiah. So for these hostile religious leaders, for them the case is closed. Jesus can't be the Messiah. They're done with him. They just want him dead. Now again, there are um, seven miracles featured in the book of John and uh, begin with Jesus turning water into wine and um, we've seen others that, uh, that, that Jesus has worked through these uh, chapters of um, feel, feeding the 5,000 and um, healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda and on and on. And here we are at the sixth out of seven miracles in the book of John. Now just to sort of recap quickly where we came from last week, we looked at verses 48 through 59, the end verses of chapter Eight. And we looked at what it had to show us about the concept of truth. 
We noted last time that um, Jesus himself uses very specific language. He, he says, Amen, Amen. So truly, truly, I say to you, this is essentially him saying, I tell you the truth. This is a, an absolutely true statement. And these words of Jesus in verse 51 are very powerful. He says, I tell you guys the truth, that if a person heeds my message, he will never see death forever. And again, we, we looked at this concept of truth and about how nothing can be built without a foundation of truth. And about how faithfulness and reliability and truth are God's attributes and truth is at the very heart of certainty in this life. And that for the world to function, it requires truth. For our lives to function in a sensible way requires truth. Thankfully, into that, God is truth. He, he is absolutely true, and he has given us absolute truth, and he, we can build our lives on a solid foundation because of that. We study God's creation, we discover truth. We study God's word, we discover truth. We study the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, we discover truth. Now the world fights against truth, but it also craves it, right? I mean, how sad is that? It finds truth to be constantly elusive, and that's a frustrating place to be, yet truth is right there the whole time. God has given the world the truth it so desperately desires. We have this statement um, down in verse 56 about Jesus um, saying that Abraham had seen his day. And we looked at that last time. What did that entail? Did, did Abraham somehow um, you know, have a, a vision, perhaps? But more likely, Abraham was able to put the pieces together through his uh, quote-unquote spiritual eyesight. He had this spiritual perception that came through, actually, through many trials. The, the difficult things that God brought into his life started to build a rich picture for Abraham of the one that God was sending to fix and to remedy everything that was painful and broken in this world and in his life. And so we saw that, first of all, Abraham saw the miraculous birth of the Messiah through the miraculous birth of his own son, Isaac. Second, Abraham saw the ministries of the Messiah through his encounter with Melchizedek, who was both a king and a priest at the same time. His name, we noted, means king of peace, uh, as the king of Salem. King of righteousness is literally what his name means. He was the king of a literal city, Salem, which would become Jerusalem. Um, and he was also called the priest of the Most High Gods. You put all these titles and, and meanings and ministries together, and you get the king who rules Jerusalem, who is uh, the king of peace, the king of righteousness, and who is priest of the Most High God. And through this, he gets another picture of the Messiah. Third, we noted that Abraham saw the personal God the God who literally came and visited him, but at the same time who was also a righteous judge and who was able in Genesis chapter 18 to condemn the city of Sodom for its wickedness. The Lord appeared to, Ab to Abraham along with two angels, and this is a, what we would call a pre-incarnate visit of the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. I had someone ask me about this a little while back, um, how do we know that this is Jesus Christ? Well, it's an easy matter of elimination. Abraham calls him the Lord, uh, but yet no one has seen God the Father. He, he hasn't um, revealed himself to mankind in terms of a personal visit. That, that doesn't happen, and, and the Holy Spirit has not taken on the form of, of a person to visit us personally, but we know that the second member of the Trinity has, and that's Jesus Christ. So this is clearly a very unique experience for Abraham being visited by Jesus Christ. He doesn't know who he is, but he knows he's the Lord. And they talk and they, they dialogue. Fourth, we saw that Abraham saw his only son, who he was called on to sacrifice. And through that, 
he recognized that God was both the God who will provide, as God did provide the ram caught in the thicket in Genesis 22, verse 8, as well as he recognized through this experience that God, even if he had um, had to go through with that, even if he had had to put to death his only son, that there had to be resurrection. We get that from Hebrews chapter 11. He believed that God could and would raise him from the dead. Now you put all these snapshots together and Abraham understands this concept of the Messiah, of the, the one that you, you put it all together. He's the son of God. He's the priest. He's the king. He's the one who would um, be called on to be sacrificed, but yet who God could raise from the dead. And, and he puts this all together with the personal God and he sees through his spiritual perception, Jesus' day. He sees ahead to what God is doing, and he sees the day of the Messiah. Now, in verse 57, this statement is met with ridicule and scorn and probably laughter as the Jews mocked Jesus' statement. And they, they misquote his words even and, and laugh about him saying that Abraham had seen his day. You know what, are you saying you've seen Abraham? That's ridiculous. You know, Abraham lived so long ago, that's, that's absurd. Jesus answered this with a very, very powerful declaration in John eight fifty eight, Before Abraham was, or before Abraham came to be, or before Abraham was born, I am. One of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible, and certainly here in the book of John, this bold declaration can only have one of two responses. They either have to respond to that by worshiping him, or they have to respond to that by stoning him. And that's their response. They, they pick up stones to stone Jesus. He very clearly in this statement Um, lays claim to the divine name Yahweh, I am that I am, or I am who I am, speaking to the fact that he is the one who is eternal, who has existed long before Abraham was ever born, and who will exist long after history on this earth is done. So God, we noted last time, is personal. He has revealed himself personally to each one of us. And his desire for each one of us, as it was the case with Abraham, is to be able to get us to build our faith in the same sense that we build our muscles, we build our strength through use, that we would build up spiritual perception that would enable us to perceive spiritual truth. We noted last time that the worst thing that can happen is for those who are indwelt by the Spirit of God and all the power that that entails to be blinded by the deception of the ruler of this world. That is really a tragedy and one that I hope that we will seek to avoid. Now that sets the stage for where we are here in chapter 9, verse 1. Let's go ahead and read through our passage. We're going to plow through a chunk of verses today. We'll have to keep moving. I'll have to not get off on too many rabbit trails here, but um, now as Jesus passed by, so Jesus is in the temple, he miraculously evades the uh, religious leaders, the, the Pharisees there who desire to kill him, and he's making his way out of the temple. It says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, He spat on the ground and made clay and with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. 
Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him, because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. And we'll also take a look at that very next verse, um, verse 24 as well, briefly this morning. Uh-oh. There we go. thought we were going to have a, a glitch there for a moment, but here's verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. So we're introduced to this man who, right from the start, um, Jesus, he, he's outside the temple and he's begging. He's born blind from birth. He doesn't have work options. This is his option in this day. He can try to get whatever gifts that people will give. And so he does the smart thing. He goes to the place where people are most likely to um, be moved with generosity. That's the temple. And also the place that is uh, the high tra highest traffic area. And that's where he sits day after day. So into this setting, you have Jesus. And Jesus walks by, and his disciples are with him. So um, presumably, somehow, he miraculously evades those that are trying to stone him. He meets up with his disciples, and they're able to exit from the temple together as a group. And this is a, a man who um, we're going to see that uh, normally people would pass by all the time. But Jesus... Look at Jesus. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So Jesus stops, and he takes notice of this man. You can just picture, you know, they're, they're used to just walking on by, walking on by, but Jesus stops. And this draws the attention of his disciples, and they ask him this question. Now, this is an interesting question because we look at it and we, we see, well, why um, do the disciples ask this kind of a question? What, what prompts this question? Why do, they, why do they ask it in this way? Um, so here, you know, there's a couple of things going on. This is probably the disciples, to one extent or another, being influenced by the teaching of the Pharisees. Perhaps they had taken on that, that idea that the Pharisees had, this kind of judgmental attitude. Um, we don't really know, but maybe they were also um, wrestling with Scripture. Because if you think about how Jesus had interacted previously in the other three Gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, with people who had physical infirmities, on more than one occasion, Jesus said to those people, your sins are forgiven. So perhaps in the, the minds of the disciples, they're starting to think, oh, well, maybe there's a connection. Jesus is telling them that their sins are forgiven um, and that they're 
ailments, their inability to walk or whatever it is, um, is because maybe they're a little bit more of a sinner than other people. If you look at, um, we find this in Luke chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Um, I'll, I'll flip there really quick. You don't have to, but you can if you'd like to. It's Luke 5, 20 and 21. Um, now, um, you have a man who was, who was paralyzed, and they couldn't find a way to get him to Jesus, and so they, they concoct a, a very interesting way to get him in front of Jesus in the midst of a very large crowd. They, um, they cut a hole through the roof, and they lower him down right on his pallet, right in front of Jesus in the middle of the crowd. Jesus notices the great faith that his friends have exercised, and he turns to the man, and he's, it says, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. So maybe this starts to spark something in the disciples. Um, oh, well, I wonder if there's something going on. Maybe he's in some way sinned, you know, in, in some way more than others that we're not aware of. Again, in Luke 7, 48 and 49, then um, there's this woman who... Um, is, is, uh, who, is um, who anoints Jesus' head with oil, or, or his, uh, his feet with, with perfume, it says. He says, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And so she is already noted as a sinful woman, and Jesus forgives her sins. So this begs the question, when Jesus says this to people, um, perhaps in the context of a, a healing that he's about to perform, as he does there in Luke chapter 5, is this person somehow a greater sinner than others? And the answer is, well, we're all sinners. Everyone is a sinner. But who has the ability to forgive sins? God. God is the great forgiver. Um, that's part of his character and who he is. And one of the aspects of Jesus healing people physically was to confirm his authority and his ability to heal everyone spiritually. And so we see that in Luke chapter 5, that, uh, verses 20 and 21, where he says, What is easier? Um, he, he says, um, who can for, there's this statement, um, who can forgive sins but God alone? And he says, um, but so that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he turns to the paralytic and says, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been laying on, and went home glorifying God. So there's this connection of Jesus using physical um, healing to confirm his ability to heal spiritually. So I think this is part of this question. This is possibly half of the question that the disciples are wrestling with, this idea that um, maybe this guy was born blind because he was in some way more sinful than others, or he had more need of being forgiven of his sins than others. But then there's this other half of this that has to do with his parents, and this is curious as well. Perhaps the disciples were thinking through Scripture and thinking of a passage um, in the Old Testament, and, you know, whether they understood the teaching of the Old Testament correctly or not, they may have been considering a passage like Exodus 34, verse 7, where it says, God does not leave the guilty unpunished. unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now, we have a similar passage over in the Ten Commandments in Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 5. And you may have read this before and think, well, how is that fair? What's going on there in that passage? But what's notable is that both of these passages, Exodus 20 and Exodus 34, are referring to God punishing sins, not punishing innocent people. In fact, we know that um, that's precisely his character and how he works and what he does. So let me flesh this out a little bit. Um, if the subsequent generations, after, let's say, there's this initial generation, who um, 
have this sinful practice, let's say. Let's say there's this initial generation who practices um, sin of one variety or another, and this, this gets passed down from generation to generation. They take on the sin. They learn from their parents and their grandparents. Um, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, God does not punish the children for the sins of their parents. It says, parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their parents. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. So if God treats us as individuals, then what is this teaching from Exodus saying? Well, it's basically the idea that one generation, let's say they conduct their uh, business by lying and cheating and stealing, there's a good chance that the next generation is going to see, well, that, you know, that worked well enough for them, and they're going to take that on, and they're going to do the same thing following in their footsteps. If it works, worked for them, it'll work for me too. But God is the God of justice. And he's going to punish the same sin in each generation who adopts it in order to break it. Because his goal is repentance and restoration through the realization that they need to be the generation to make the change. Now, this statement in both of these passages, or or at least in Exodus 20, verses 5 through 7, goes along with a wonderful promise to go with it. It says, um, it says to the, um, you shall not worship them. It, the, cons- the backdrop is idolatry, the, the second of the Ten Commandments. He says, you shall not worship them or serve them, idols, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness, our Old Testament word for grace, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. That is God's heart to show love and faithfulness and grace to generation upon generation upon generation who love him. So maybe the disciples were wrestling with these kinds of concepts. Maybe they they were trying to understand Scripture, but they were a little confused by it. They had the teaching of the Pharisees. They were a little confused by it. They had taken on some of these attitudes of judgmentalism. And into that, God's will is that we would judge ourselves and follow Jesus' example of seeking to help others. But you know what so often happens Because we're sinful people, we act just the opposite. We're quick to help ourselves and judge others. But throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus seeking to to help those who are so desperately in need of help. And that's really the, the context of this passage. Jesus' heart is one that desires to heal this man, to help him. So Jesus answers the disciples with basically none of the above. It wasn't his parents that were especially sinful. It wasn't this man that was especially sinful. I mean, sure, he's a sinner. So are the disciples. So are all of us. But his answer was that this man was blind from birth for a reason. Let's let's take a look at that. Um, So here's the disciples' question. Here's these passages. Um, So in this Here's our concept from the Old Testament. Whether the disciples understood the teaching correctly or not, they may have been thinking it this way, that um, the guilty, God punishes the guilty, maybe he's somehow punishing the children for the sins of their parents. But Jesus answered, no, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Essentially, this man was blind since birth, specifically so that God would be glorified through him. And that's powerful. Specifically, that the mighty works of God would be manifested in him. Jesus answered that God allowed this man's blindness so that he would be brought glory. He didn't say that, you know, that the miracle that we know is to follow. We've read the story would be that so that everyone was blown away and wowed, but that God would be glorified. 
This man who had to beg every single day is about to be used by God in a very powerful way. He allowed this man to be born blind so that decades down the road, at this exact moment in time, Jesus would cross paths with him and that something would happen. A miracle would take place and that as a result, God would receive glory. We might think about that. Why, Why was this man born blind decades ago? Why was he made to suffer in this way? Why was he left destitute and had to beg day after day at the temple? Why was his life so hard? Why did he have to stumble around in the darkness? Why did he never have a chance to see you with his eyes? It was because God was preparing to do something mighty. Which brings us to the concept of suffering. When we think about suffering, why does God allow suffering? I think we can observe um, three purposes uh, for, for suffering that uh, is why God allows suffering. But just to set the backdrop against that, we don't want to miss the obvious that suffering is caused by sin. That we essentially live in a, a sinful, fallen world ever since the original sin of Adam and Eve that, that cursed us as human beings. It, uh, you know, it, it caused physical ailments and sickness and disease and um, you know, basically uh, entropy within our bodies. It caused the same thing in our physical environment. It caused the um, things to, to rust and to corrode and, and to die and for weeds to grow and everything, every condition on earth to be marred by sin. So because there's sin in the world, why would God allow suffering? I believe we can observe three purposes why God allows us to suffer. The first is it is corrective discipline. That sometimes we just make really dumb choices and sinful choices, and God sends pain along as a punishment in order to get us back on the right track. This would be uh, along the lines of spanking, right? Um, you know, why, why does um, the book of Proverbs uh, prescribe uh, you know, a spanking as a, a form of discipline of children, um, it's designed to get them back on track, right? We should first ask God if our suffering is his disciplining us. I mean, that's, that's where we want to start. Have I, have I uh, engaged in sin or maybe even an area of sin that I'm not aware of? Maybe, maybe I have um, been oblivious to my own um, harmful behavior toward others, and I'm not even aware of it. Or, you know, Lord, help me to see the things that I'm not seeing. At that point, once we recognize it, we confess our sin to God, and we get back on track with his revealed will for us. So that's one possibility, that it's discipline from the Lord. Second is it's constructive refining, that God sends pain in order to refine us, like refiner's fire it talks about throughout the Old Testament of, you know, it, it's a, a, you know, if you think about the, the pains, the quote-unquote pain that um, is involved in refining metal like gold and silver, the heat is extreme. Does God turn up the heat on us? Yes, in order to conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ, in order to produce something beautiful, he sometimes will allow suffering as the um, mechanism to do just that. Number three, it's for his glory, and that's what's on display in this passage. We sometimes suffer because God is using it for a much higher purpose or to set up something yet future in which his glory will be manifested and magnified in such a greater degree in and through us. And that perspective requires a perspective of faith. We, we're all sinners And we can all be expected to suffer that corrective and constructive suffering at various points in our lives. However, God works on such a big level, and he's in charge of such complex details that we can barely even begin to understand. If we think about Job, Job was a righteous man, and he was afflicted in a terrible way. And we're told why, and it was for the glory of God. 
that through Job's suffering, Satan's accusations were proven dead wrong. He accused Job of, well, you know, he only loves you, God, for the, the things that you do for him, for his um, wealth, for his family, for his good health, for all these things. And in the midst of God allowing these things into Job's life, terrible loss, and the grief that went with it, we see Job continuing to honor the Lord, to bless God and to refuse to blame him. He doesn't understand and he wrestles with the fact that he doesn't understand, but he continues to be faithful to God and to, um, to seek not to um, blame God, to get angry, to, um, to sin in, in the midst of his suffering. He's a righteous man. And through that example of someone like Job, we recognize that we sometimes suffer because God is using it for a much higher purpose or, again, to set up something in the future in which he will be glorified and magnified through us. So there's a little um, snippet on the purposes that God um, allows, why God allows suffering. Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Now, this is really interesting. Um, I know in Spanish, we got a couple of different work, words, o, obra and um, uh, trabajar, to, to work. Um, in, in Greek, as in English, it's just one work, one word for, for work. Um, Jesus says that he has to work. Now, we say this every day, don't we? Well, I got to work. I, I got to go to work. But we don't often think about God sending his son, Jesus Christ, to work. When we think about Jesus' earthly ministry, do we ever think about it as his job? Yet God the Father, in fact, sent Jesus to work. And that's profound. When we think about that, what What was Jesus' work to do? Well, it was consistent with God's will for him. We see Jesus being very compelled to do the work that was required of him. And we see Jesus motivated by his love for others and how he could remedy their greatest problems and needs, primarily spiritually. And the greatest um, need that we all have is the problem of, of sin and the fact that if nothing changes, we're headed to hell. That's our destination. Um, So the greatest gift that we could ever be given is the gift of salvation, of our sins forgiven, of uh, the one who died in our place, and for us to be given the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. So he came to deal with humanity's greatest needs, primarily spiritually, but also physically and emotionally during his earthly ministry. So what can we have, the word I'm searching for is extract. What can we extract from this to build our theology of work? And I think this is really, really important for us. We have to have a good understanding of why we work. And our biblical outlook should mirror that of our Lord Jesus. God sent Jesus to work. We see Jesus, um, these are the, the things that we observe in Jesus' ministry, in his approach to work, that our theology of work should mirror. One, he sought, to, he sought work that was in line with God's will for him. Two, he felt called or compelled to do this particular unique work. And three, he was motivated by his love for others and how he could meet the needs of others. This is others-focused. It's service-oriented. So we could summarize it like this. The most rewarding work you will ever do is the work that you recognize is consistent with God's will and priorities, generally speaking, biblically speaking, but also as it applies to your life, that you're passionate about. What do you love doing? What is your unique gifting and skill set and that which you recognize you can bring to the table? You're passionate about it. Also that you feel compelled to do it. You could feel specifically that this is my calling from God. I, I feel called to serve in health care as a nurse or whatever it is. 
I feel compelled to go down this road. Also, work that involves serving others or providing goods and services to others is powerful. To recognize that what you are actively engaged in goes to help and improve the lives of other people. You know, I, I think that this has a lot of applications when we consider areas where this applies. We think of, um, you know, we, we think of Jesus' approach to work and the work that we do. And we think, what are the, what are the similarities? Because obviously his ministry was from God the Father. His ministry was, di- was divine. His ministry was to save the world. It was obviously to serve others. But can I make application of that to my own life and work? And the answer is yes. Um, it doesn't matter what you're doing. In some way, it has to be affecting other people. Um, and to the, the greatest extent that you can realize that on a regular daily basis as you go about your work, it will impact how you view your work. Um, I, I know that um, some of you are, are in um, waste disposal. Wh- what a powerful thing. Have you ever had your garbage um, pile up on you? All of a sudden you have a public health crisis. It's really bad. Um, this week at our house, the garbage truck got every garbage can on the street except for ours. And so now we've got double the garbage flowing out of our can, and it's a mess. And I don't know what happened, but um, those things are a service that you provide to others. When I worked in a a hospital, um, I was responsible for feeding the patients in the hospital. And I can tell you that on a number of occasions, I didn't feel like it. (laughs) But having the proper perspective would make a big difference um, because it could feel like drudgery, but if I could have the perspective of, you know, these people, they probably don't want to be in the hospital to begin with, but this is part of nourishing them, of helping them to heal, um, of giving them their proper needs according to their diets, and, um, and helping them, and maybe even um, brightening their day a little bit. Um, I remember sometimes I would have to work on Christmas, and that was always kind of a tough one, um, but I thought, how much more difficult is it for the patients? Because pretty much to a patient, none of them wanted to be there on Christmas. If they were there, they, that was their, they were there on Christmas because they couldn't find a way to get their doctor to send them home before Christmas. And, uh, and so, so one year, I don't know if you girls remember that, when, when they were little, I had them uh, draw some little uh, Merry Christmas, you know, um, uh, snowmen, you know, may you have joy, just little cards, that, like little table tent cards, and then I could put on their trays um, at their meals on, on Christmas. You remember that? And that really did brighten their days. And, you know, those, those little things of how we view our job make all the difference. So if you're a teacher, how is what you're doing serving those students? If, if you're nursing, how is what you're doing serving those patients? And on and on and on and on. So Jesus is going to tell us a little bit more. He says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now you think about the context of this. He's standing before a man who doesn't have a concept of light. And this is the statement that he makes. So what is going on here? Jesus has um, made this statement just back in John chapter 8, verse 12, uh, where there's the woman who was caught in adultery standing before him. And Jesus issues this statement, and it has a slightly different application. In that statement, in John 8, 12, with the woman caught in adultery, Jesus exposed those who were in the darkness who didn't think they were in the darkness. The sinful men who were accusing that woman caught in adultery who thought that they were perfectly uh, sinless and in a position to do that quickly realized that they were not. But here in John chapter 5, when Jesus issues these same words, he does so in a little bit different application, a little bit different context. It's the sense of the fact that light removes darkness. And as it's going to apply to this man, by giving a man his, uh, who is in physical darkness the ability to see, light is going to break through his darkness physically. So Jesus... Um, here we, we see his ministry. He stepped into time. 
You know, I, I, I think about these things a lot, um, probably more than I ought to, but um, about time and the fact that we live in the dimension of time, but God is outside of time. Jesus stepped into time, and as such, when he was on this earth, when he was walking around those dirty streets, he started to recognize that his time was limited. And I think we all feel the weight of that. We feel the weight of time's limitation. And Jesus responded to that with a sense of urgency. For all of us, do we share Jesus' sense of urgency? Like Jesus, each of us has a very limited window of time on this earth. Some of us are going to have more, some are going to have less, and, and none of us knows how much time we're going to have. But Jesus was teaching the disciples here about the importance of making the most of their time on this earth. And this is a valuable concept. We all need this. In a sense, we're all on borrowed time because none of us know if today will be our last day on this earth. That's one of those things as, as a pastor, you, you never know, you know, when am I going to get a call that, that so-and-so that... Um, you know, is, is a valuable person in my life that I've come to minister to and to love is going to go to be with the Lord. And I rejoice for them when that happens, um, but it is a, a, a great loss for those of us behind. If we, if we view ourselves in that way, that today could be my last day, does that give us a sense of urgency that we recognize that our time is limited? Jesus says, night is coming. He says um, in verse, verse 5 there, uh, verse, is it 4? He says, the night is coming when no one can work. He says, My, um, I, I've got so much daylight and then night is coming. He, he applies this illustration that we can all understand. There's certain things that we just can't do in the darkness that we can do in the light. And he uses that for to illustrate his ministry. He's like, my time is limited. I got to make the most of my time here. The night is coming and, and then time runs out. Are we making the most of our time? So Jesus, verse 5, um, ah, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So let's see what he's going to do here in verse 6. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. So something very unusual. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, um, commentators have observed that Jesus encountered a number of blind people who he gave sight to. And all of them, he did it differently. Sometimes he spoke, sometimes he touched. Some, here he makes this mud with saliva. We could ask the question, why did Jesus do this this way? Well, for one, he treats each individual individually. He deals with people uniquely. And sometimes people think, well, um, Jesus must deal with every person exactly the same. Therefore, I'm going to prescribe that God should do this or that or the other thing. But God doesn't work like that. He deals with us uniquely, individually. And for this man, he makes this mud pie, I guess you could say, this um, clay, and he puts it on this, man eyes, on this man's eyes, and we could say, why did he do it this way? And I think that we could answer the question twofold. One is kind of obvious. Having this messy clay stuck to your eyes would be annoying, and every single one of us would be eager to get that washed off. And number two, Jesus was providing the precise conditions for this man to see the powerful work of God, for his faith to be exercised and for him to be the recipient of God's grace. So for all of us, sometimes God allows various ailments and undesirable circumstances in our lives for similar reasons, so that he can demonstrate his mighty work and that he can build up our faith in the process so that we can exercise even greater faith in him, but at the same time, demonstrate his mighty works. Let's look at the subsequent verses here. Um, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And um, we referenced this back last summer, if you remember back to the, the 4th of July. Um, 
This is one of the great blessings of modern archaeology is that in recent years, just in the last few years, they've actually uncovered in Jerusalem the Pool of Siloam. You can go there to this day, and um, part of it is still buried, a large part of it. There's kind of a, a garden area that they haven't excavated yet, but part of it they have, including um, once it had stairs on, I think, all four sides, and on one side they've uncovered the stairs, and you can actually walk down into the water exactly as this man would have. They've also, uh, we'll put that, um, they've also uncovered these very stairs. These are the exact stairs that this man walked. This is the walkway from the temple to the pool of Siloam. So again, just in the last few years, archaeology has uncovered some really amazing things. That's what the uncovered section to this very day looks like at the pool of Siloam. You can go there and um, these may have been this, these very exact steps that the man walked down now you think about this, and this would be a very hazardous trip for Jesus to send a blind man on. So hopefully he had people who could help him. Um, but Jesus sends the blind man down here, and he washes this clay from his eyes. He comes back out, and he can see for the first time in his life. Here's three reasons um, why Jesus um, it did miracles during his earthly ministry. One, to relieve human suffering. Um, two, as a platform for communicating spiritual truth. Um, the physical healing would be directly related to the spiritual um, truth that he was communicating. And three, to prove his credentials, that he was, in fact, the Messiah. Verse 8, uh, therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, isn't this the guy that we've, every single day we've known him to be here and beg forever? Is this not he who sat and begged, they said? This is going to create quite a, a stir. This is going to create quite a conundrum. In these next verses, um, verses 10, 15, 19, and 26, um, they're going to ask the same question four times. The essence of it is, how is it that you're now able to see? They knew. They, they very well knew exactly what happened. And the reason they ask it four different times is because they didn't want to believe it. A little bit about the Pharisees. The Pharisees' big, um, their, their baby essentially was the Sabbath. That, that was their be-all and end-all biggest concern ever. And so they look to Jesus as one who now does this on the Sabbath. Um, there's this controversy. Some said, yes, you know, this is him. Others said, well, it looks like him, but I don't know if it is him. And he answers, yes, you know, I am he. Um, uh, ego eimi is the word, uh, not coming from the Son of God. It doesn't have a powerful connotation that's going to make everybody fall backwards. He just acknowledges, yes, is this him? Yes, I am him. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? So these people that have known him for all these years, these neighbors, these friends, they, they've seen the family. They, they know him. And they say, how were your eyes opened? He comes back and he's seeing for the first time in his life and their lives, and they're actually unsure they're confused and he answered and said a man called jesus that's all he knows is how he's referred made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me go to the pool of siloam and wash so i went and washed and i received sight he tells them exactly what happens they said to him where is he and he said i don't know you know once he went down to the pool he didn't know what happened to jesus after that they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now this is interesting because according to the Old Testament scriptures, if a person was healed from blindness, you would bring them to the high priest. They bring him to those who consider themselves the, the movers and shakers, the, the ones who are ready to make the correct determinations, but who weren't the ones to make that determination, but that's who they bring him to. Now it was a Sabbath. And this is probably why they bring him to the Pharisees, because they're the guardians of the Sabbath. That's, their, that's their, big, their big issue. And the Pharisees 
asked him again, the same question that the neighbors ask him, um, how he received his sight. So he tells them the same thing, exactly what happened. Well, you know, he mixed up this clay, he put it on my eyes, uh, I, I washed, and now I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. That's their big thing. He's a Sabbath breaker. Others said, well, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was division among them, very similar language to what Nicodemus actually said um, in John chapter 3. So they're divided. There's a, a, um, a schism. They they're, uh, they're have different opinions on this Jesus and his healing. And it's on the Sabbath. Is that good? Is that bad? What do we make of this? And some are antagonistic and some are not ready to be antagonistic. And they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? You know, they've, they're divided, so they ask him, what, what, what say you? Because he opened your eyes, and he said, well, he's a prophet. And that's actually a really good answer. Because if you think back to his frame of reference in the Old Testament, who were the ones working miracles? It was the prophets that God sent. Our scripture reading this morning was from 1 Kings chapter or Second Kings, I'm sorry, chapter 5 in, in Elisha. And through Elisha, God miraculously healed Naaman, the leper. And he had him do something unexpected, dunking in water in the Jordan River. Um, it seemed odd, it seemed simplistic, but that's exactly what happened. Over in Matthew chapter 11, there's this instance where the, uh, John the Baptist is in prison, and he asks... He asks um, of Jesus, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So he lists five kinds of miraculous healings that are associated with himself and his ministry, and out of those five, I really only, you know, maybe you can think of others, but I only think of two um, that are ones that we associate with the Old Testament, the, the leper being cleansed and the dead being raised up. If you consider the ministries of Elijah and Elisha, um, maybe there's more that are just not coming to my mind right now, but I, I know with certainty that there was no blind person healed in the Old Testament. Uh, we don't have a record of that. So this is new territory. So Jesus uses this as proof to John the Baptist that, yes, I am exactly the one, the Messiah, that you are to be expecting. You don't have it wrong. And so he associates Jesus' ministry with that of Elijah and Elisha, and for good reason. Now, this is not going to set well with the Pharisees, um, and they're going to haul in his parents. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. I mean, in the Old Testament, that never happened, right? It, it was hypothetically possible, but it had never happened. And in, in practical everyday experience, I mean, even today, that would be a very startling thing for somebody to say, I was blind, and then all of a sudden, I, you know, I had this treatment on my eyes, and I, now I see. Until they called his parents, and they, they wanted to ask them, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How does he now see? So they're obviously antagonistic. They're skeptical. They want to get a second opinion. And the, 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 par the parents presumably know. They've heard their son say that it was this Jesus figure who is obviously the stir of Jerusalem, who's been going around doing miracles, that he's the one that their son says healed him. Um, but they're not prepared to say that because they're afraid to acknowledge that to the Pharisees. They were essentially afraid of what the Pharisees could do to them. They wielded a lot of power. They were afraid that if they answered um, affirmatively that Jesus is the one who did this, then they're going to be forced to answer a lot more questions that would um, cause caused them to have to acknowledge that they believed him to be the Messiah or that he could be the Messiah. And if the Pharisees heard any of that kind of talk, they would 
immediately used their power to expel them from the synagogue there in Jerusalem. Now, I think it's easy for us to criticize these parents, but the question obviously is, do we ever do this? Let's keep reading here. Uh, Verse 20, his parents answered them and said, we know this is our son, and we, we can definitely say, yes, he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. But he's of age, ask him. Like, you know, he's an adult. He'll, he can speak for himself. So they kind of try to make their exit. They, they find their way out, and it's by uh, putting this back to their son. The parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give glory, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Now this is a really interesting statement that these Pharisees make. They say, we want you to glorify God by testifying that this man is a sinner. If you remember, we talked about uh, glory briefly in terms of a definition last week. Um, If we apply that definition of glory to us as human beings, uh, glory being a noun, doxa in the Greek, for us as human beings, the experience of perceiving, sharing in, or declaring God's glory, to glorify God, to give glory, to declare his glory through worship and praise as humanity's highest duty and privilege. And what they're asking this man to do is the opposite. It is absolutely inconsistent with God's character. God is not a sinner. God is not sinful. They're asking him to do something very wrong. Now, again, I'd say that it's easy for us to criticize these parents for being afraid of these Pharisees. They don't want to lose their privileges, their access to the synagogue, their place in society. They, they, they can't imagine the thought of that. And it causes them to be very afraid of the Pharisees. But how about us? Do we ever make wrong decisions because of fear? I think this is um, particularly true as a younger person. Maybe you're a teenager here this morning and, um, or a, you know, a young adult that you have a, a, a large fear of others in terms of maybe they're going to laugh at you. Maybe you fear, fear the social pressure, both young people and older adults, to not go against the prevailing groupthink you know, what everybody else approves of, what everybody else does, what everybody else thinks. Or maybe you're the type of person you fear ruffling feathers. You know, why do you have to be the one to upset things? You know, you, a lot of times you get Christianese thrown into this. Um, you know, well, you know, God is just trying to bring everybody together and bring peace, and why do you have to be divisive? And you're just like, oh, here we go again. Yes, it's going to be divisive sometimes to obey God rather than men. You've got to take a stand sometimes. Maybe you fear what, what it might mean for your relationships with family members or friends. You fear what that might mean for you financially. You fear people or potential consequences over and above your fear of God and what he wants of you. If you take a stand for God, I'm going to put this up here. If you take a stand for God here in the white, God will stand up with you. What can man do to you if God is with you? This is a a powerful concept, the fear of man. Fear of God, fear of man. This is a constant um, situation that we all wrestle with, that we all are, are doing internal battle with. What's going to drive the decisions we make? What's going to compel us? What's going to cause the, the scale to tip one way or another? This is particularly, particularly important for those of you that are on the younger end of the age scale. It's important for all of us. But if you're younger, there's huge pressure, both external and especially internal, 
not to rock the boat. It's also an application on the other side of it, not to be the kind of person that tries to coerce others. Be concerned first and foremost with what God wants and his perspective of how we should act and, uh, and, and be of the mindset of trying to apply that to your relationships with others rather than somehow trying to be persuasive of your own will. Well, I hate to leave this hanging, but this is a really long chapter. So we're going to have to conclude there for this morning. We'll pick up here next week. Um, But we'll conclude with this. The message of the gospel. The gospel is good news. Jesus Christ came to save sinners out of his great love for humanity. If the gospel is good news, well, that we can assume that that also begins with bad news. The bad news is that we're all sinners. We're all lost. We're all hopeless. We're all under the curse and the penalty of sin. We all deserve and are destined for hell. Unless something changed, and that's the good news, that God wasn't willing, it says that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that we should have a a change of mind, that we should have a, a mindset of who God is and what he came to do and what that means for me, and we switch our mind about all of that. We recognize that God loved each of us as individuals. He deals with us each as individuals. And yet, he applied the same hope and the same healing and the same promise to all of us. It's available for all of us through the gospel. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for each of us. He's a personal God, and he saved you personally. The the thing before all of us is that a decision has to be made. That just as God deals with us individually, an individual has to be made to receive his provision of salvation, saving us from that which was killing us, and that is the sin and its consequences. So the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It also says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So if you're here and you've never personally trusted in Jesus Christ, that's the message of salvation. That's where life is. It's through his sacrifice on the cross for you that you have life. You have forgiveness of sins. All your sins you'll ever commit forgiven at the cross of Jesus Christ. Sin's penalty is wiped out. It's done. And you're given new life. You're given eternal life. And if you look at the gospel of John, that eternal life starts now. It awaits us in the future. Life isn't going to end, but that that new life starts right now, eternal life. And it's yours if you will simply trust in Jesus Christ by faith. That's the mechanism saying, I accept what he did on my behalf. I receive it as mine. I put my full faith, faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ to save me. He did what I could never do for myself. He died for me so that I can live. Let's close with prayer this morning, then we'll have our final song. Father, thank you for this time we've had in your word. Lord, I pray that this passage, it's a long passage, but it's rich. And I pray that it would sink in deep with each of us, that we would seek to apply its rich application to our lives and how we approach work, how we think about suffering. Lord, and how we weigh the fear of man versus the fear of you. Lord, may we seek to please you and honor you and obey you over and above people. Lord, we want to recognize your great love for us and how we can demonstrate our love for you because you first loved us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to make application of this as we go about our lives. And Lord, we know that you cause divine encounters, that nothing's an accident with you. So whoever you bring across our paths this week, Lord, help us to have your perspective, to seek to have the perspective that's given to us by your Holy Spirit as we walk with you, that we may share truth with them. Again, Lord, truth is the foundation upon which all is built and which this world so desperately needs. Thank you for giving it to us. May we walk in it this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we close.
words of 2 Peter chapter 3, my friends. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.